welcome to Digital Earth Ice. We're so happy to have you. This is a, a, an ongoing program that we've been doing at the Dunn Museum of Nature and Science for over 10 years. Um, and this month we're talking about ice. Next month on March 24th will be about Stonehenge to skyscrapers, human-made structures you can see from Earth. And as you're watching the presentation, if you have questions, put those in the chat and um, I will write those down and we'll get to those at the end of the program. And I think it's time to start. So I will hand it off to our astronomer at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, Kachun. All right, well, thank you very much, Mitch. Uh, before we begin the program, I'd like to acknowledge that we in Denver were on land that is the traditional homelands of the Cheyenne and Arapaho, who were the original stewards of this land. And we also acknowledge um, other indigenous tribes and nations that make Colorado home today. So welcome to Digital Earth, everyone. And um, as Mitch uh, mentioned, you might have heard, um, this program um, started in the planetarium and we've um, gone remote and online over uh, this past year. And the philosophy of Digital Earth is to basically explore our home planet using uh, digital visualization tools um, so that you get the experience of seeing our home planet from space. And um, in the planetarium, we get the feeling that we're actually flying through space um, that's um, perhaps not quite possible unless you have a really large TV set in which you're watching us tonight. But uh, hopefully um, we'll be able to return to the dome before uh, not too long and uh, you'll get a, a fully immersive experience. Um, but um, I want to point out that um, everything that you uh, will be seeing here um, tonight is based on real data that has been observed uh, by satellites, that has been processed by scientists, and uh, we're presenting it um, to you. And um, a lot of this data uh, was made possible by, by federal uh, government funding um, agencies, um, including NASA. And in fact, the software that we're using, Open Space, is actually funded by NASA. And it's um, actually still somewhat experimental, but uh, we've been um, very um, quite happy to use it. And uh, we um, thank NASA for their support of this and uh, other programs using the software. And uh, with that, um, I also want to point out that um, we, uh, because um, we are uh, funded by NASA, we are also interested, um, and NASA is very interested, in um, how uh, this program uh, looks to you. So at the end um, of uh, our presentation tonight, um, we'll uh, put a, a link in the chat uh, that will um, be a link to a survey that um, we'd like you um, to take. And uh, we will also email that out too. Um, to everyone who registered. And I, I think for the first um, 50 uh, participants of the survey, um, you will get a chance to get a, um, a free NASA sticker um, home delivered um, to your home address. So with that, I want to introduce um, Bob Reynolds, who is a geologist and a research associate um, at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. And uh, he will uh, be uh, giving the main presentation well, I um, will fly us through our um, simulated Earth. Bob, take it away. <laughs> thank you, Kachun. And uh, thank you, Mitch, for helping set this all up. And uh, we're delighted to uh, be with you guys all tonight. We've got people from all over the world, as I understand it, from the uh, earlier chat discussion. And it's a wonderful chance for us to share this technology uh, with you. And it's a, it's a great program that uh, the Denver Museum has been uh, putting together for many years now. Uh, each of these evenings is a sort of a one-shot deal. In, in other words, we're, we're doing this for the first time uh, in Katrina and I in terms of flying around looking at ice. And so we've uh, rehearsed it a little bit. We've got some definite uh, trajectories and ideas, but uh, bear with us. Uh, it's a little bit of an experiment every time we do this. So. There's a lot of moving parts and a lot of different uh, pieces of software and hardware involved in this evening's presentation. Uh, what we're going to be doing is uh, we're going to be looking at the distribution of ice on the surface of the Earth, uh, looking at glaciers, uh, looking at the polar regions, particularly the northern polar regions. And um, we're going to start out with a review of glaciers and then looking at some of the famous glaciers around the world. And then we're going to look at a little bit more in detail at uh, Greenland. Uh, we'll be looking at the effect of uh, melting ice. We'll be considering the uh, effect it has on sea level and the resulting uh, changes that are going on associated with warming of the polar regions in particular. 
And uh, then we'll move into a portion of the program where we'll look at the record in ICE. Uh, ICE preserves in information in layers, and we'll look at the coring process. Uh, so we'll look at ICE a little bit as a, as a recorder of Earth history phenomena. Um, and then at the, towards the very end, uh, we'll hand it back off to, uh, to Kachun, and we'll uh, have a little opportunity to investigate uh, ice perhaps on some other places besides the Earth. So we've got a, a full program for you this evening. It'll take about an hour, and we will leave uh, a little bit of time at the very end for, for Q&A. So if you do have questions, pop them in the chat, and uh, we'll try to handle some of those at the very end. So we'll get started uh, thinking about the Earth. Uh, the Earth is often called the water planet. And as you know, it's uh, covered in water in many places. 70% uh, plus of the Earth's surface is water. Uh, it's salt water, of course, in the oceans. And uh, we're interested in fresh water, uh, particularly as our civilization relies on, on liquid water. And it turns out that if you were to consider the entire volume of water on the Earth's surface and put it in a gallon jug, uh, proportionally, the amount of fresh water would be three shot glasses. So out of a gallon, just three shot glasses are fresh water. And two of those shot glasses are frozen. So the, the amount of uh, ice on the surface of the Earth is, is, the, is two thirds of the fresh water that's available on the surface of the Earth is frozen as ice. And uh, that's what we're going to be talking about uh, over the course of the evening. And uh, what I wanted to do was uh, get us uh, started with thinking about why ice is where it is on the Earth's surface. And as you all know, the polar areas tend to have ice accumulating and uh, tend to be colder. And it might not be intuitively obvious why the poles are, are cold. And so I've got a, a sophisticated experiment here, which I'm going to try to show you um, here in my basement in Longmont. And if I get spotlighted, you guys will see this. Um, I've got a globe that I'm, I'm holding in my hands. And uh, this is you know, a, a nice National Geographic globe. And uh, you can see that it's uh, a nice sphere. And if I take uh, my sophisticated illumination device here, which um, I'm trying to poke because I've been, I know that this thing can turn into a flashlight if I push all the right buttons. Um, there, I've, I've created a flashlight. If, if the sun, if the flashlight is the sun, you can see that it illuminates the equatorial zones very brightly. And you'll also see that the high latitudes meeting up by the poles, I'll just hide behind it here, has a raking light. The light is, is oblique, and the beams from the sun are coming from a long distance away. They're effectively parallel. They come in, and they hit the Earth in the equatorial zones full on, but they're glancing at low angles uh, up at the high latitudes, the North and the South Pole. So there's just not as much solar energy coming into the polar regions. Uh, because you get this low angle of illumination. Of course, the Earth is tilted on its axis by 23 degrees, and so that varies across through the seasons. But the net effect is that the polar regions get a very low amount of solar energy, and that is one of the particular reasons why they are cold and frozen. The other thing that's happening at the polar regions is that the, uh, the ice tends to reflect the solar energy. So there's a reflectivity associated with the white color of ice. And so much of the modest energy that does arrive in the polar regions gets reflected away, uh, resulting in even colder conditions. Um, so that's uh, the, the basic principle of, of why it is cold at the poles. Uh, but let's go into a, an, an examination of, of ice on the surface of the Earth. And we're going to see that, that um, one of the things that we have uh, a, a wonderful array of in the United States, in, the, in, in Alaska, are glaciers. And we're going to do a, a discussion of uh, three glacial areas in Alaska. And you, those of you who are looking at the background behind Mitch when he was leading us into this presentation will, will recognize the, um, the glacier that we're going to come to first. And so we're, we're, we're coming into southeastern Alaska. And 
we're going to look at some of these glaciers that are coming off of the high mountains that border uh, Alaska and British Columbia and Canada. And they're feeding down towards the uh, North Pacific here. And this, this glacier that we're looking at right now is the Malaspina Glacier. And you can see that it's, it's coming off of the, uh, I think that might be the Mount, the St. Elias Mountains, but in any case, it's coming down onto uh, a, a zone that's near the uh, ocean, but it's not actually hitting the ocean. It's, this is called a Piedmont Glacier. It's one of the largest Piedmont glaciers in the world. And the ice is coming down continuously from the far background, and it's sort of puddling up on the coastal plain there. And we call this the Taffy Puddle Glacier. <laughs> it's a very beautiful scene, uh, as you can see here on using open space. And you can also do this uh, using Google Earth. So you guys at home can travel to Alaska using Google Earth, and you can investigate uh, this glacier yourselves. The, the alternating dark and uh, white areas in the glacier are a function of the amount of debris, uh, rocky debris that's on that glacier. We'll talk a little bit about more about that later on. It serves to identify the flow patterns, though, and so you can clearly see uh, the elaborate flow patterns rather dramatically exposed here. And uh, we've got a, a video that was put together by NASA that will show us the uh, changing character of these uh, through time. And we can run this video a couple of times so you can see the ice is coming in from the north. It's feeding in and it's literally ponding up uh, on the flats there, uh, creating this uh, plateau of ice, which is called the Malaspina Glacier. But the, the glacier that's feeding it is the Seward Glacier. So the, the glacier feeding it has one name and the big taffy puddle has, has another name. The other fun thing is that, of course, it's not quite getting to the ocean. And you'll see right down at the lower left, there's a little river that does emanate uh, into the sea. And uh, that's one of the shortest rivers in North America. And it's only about a mile and a half long. Kachin, we might uh, scoot back over to open space and we can look at that little river that's down on the, just on the lower left of the screen there. And you know, I just want to point out that that's the area where one of those very, it's a very short river. If you were, if you're walking along the coast, it would be a serious obstacle to navigation because there's a lot of water that's pouring out there, carrying a lot of sediment, of course. But it's a, it is a super short river, and we're very proud of our short river. But later on in the program, we'll show you an even shorter one. So some of you might have been to the shortest river in Europe. We're going to go to there eventually, but uh, it's it's a little bit shorter than our short river. So we're going to back up away from uh, the Malaspina Glacier, and we're going to not go too far. We're going to stay in Alaska, and we're going to go to something called the Grand Plateau Glacier. And the Grand Plateau Glacier is another fascinating glacier that uh, I've only seen it from, from space, but it's a beautiful thing to see. And, and you can see, again, that it's coming off the high mountains uh, right on the United States-Canada border here. And it's a series of glaciers actually that are being fed. And uh, if you look closely at these glaciers, you'll see that they've got lateral moraines, which means the moraine on the side of the glacier. And when two glaciers come together, the lateral moraines from both glaciers converge and come together to form what's called a medial moraine. So those two glaciers that are feeding together have a black stripe in between, which is called a medial moraine. The other thing you'll see is that the glaciers have these black stripes on them. And I'll let you noodle on what those might be, and we'll talk about them in a second. They've also got these, these systematic stripes. So there's, there's like systematic stripes and then the black stripes, the more prominent. The systematic stripes are called olgives, and they actually represent annual cycles in the glacier. And this glacier, these glaciers and, and others in this area come off of steep mountains. And where the glaciers go off a, off a, a cliff, uh, like an ice fall, it pulses across that ice fall on an annual cycle. It's faster in the warmer time, slower in the colder time. And that is recorded in the ice. So the ice has annual little ribbons in it. And you can count how many years are involved. And then it's also got those those black episodic 
uh, well, it's got the medial moraines, which are black. It's got all kinds of crevasses and fractures, but it's got those little black pulses on it, which uh, we might, could you, may we pull around and go back up the glacier and look at some of those black stripes. And uh, you can see one right there in the right hand side. And again, I'm asking you to ponder what these might be. And maybe some of you will have put that in the um, chat. Um, someone's asked me for the name of the, I'll write the name of the thing in a second in the chat with the old guys. Um, but the, the black stripes, so does someone guess what those black stripes are? The, the, I'm talking about the big black things. What do you think those might be? Yes, I'm seeing a good answer. Yes, yes. Okay, people are getting the right answer in the, um, in the I'm, I'm putting old guys in there. It says, you know, I type old guys and it corrects my spelling to olives. So it's not olives, it's old guys. I don't know if I can get that to. Oh, maybe it did. Okay, so this, these black stripes are landslides. And uh, if we back out, we'll back out a little bit and then we'll, we'll turn on a video and you'll be able to actually see how these black stripes uh, behave through time in this flowing, this is called the Grand Plateau Glacial Area. These are images uh, that'll be coming to you from, from NASA once we get the video running. Ogives. It doesn't have an L in it. The video is running, Bob. Okay. It, again, it's correcting my spelling to olives, so I'm sorry. To... <laughs> so you can hear now you're watching this uh, glacier move through time courtesy of NASA, and you can see those, those rock slides come down onto the glacier and then are carried downstream uh, literally by the moving ice. The ice is flowing. And uh, some of the scenes have go white because it's in the wintertime and there's snow on top of the black stuff. But in the summertime, you'll see those black stripes uh, moving down. So the, the glacier is carrying a wonderful record of the evolution of these landscapes. And of course, it's carving the land the ice is carving the land. We can see it very dramatically here. And uh, we're going to investigate that in a couple minutes in Colorado. But you can see here the, the, the active dynamic movement of the ice. And of course, ice is a mineral, effectively. It's a naturally solid occurring uh, organized uh, crystalline structure. It fits all the definitions of mineral. So uh, you're seeing a flowing mineral there on the surface of the Earth. And a wonderful view there. Of course, the ice, all these glaciers are changing through time. And uh, we're going to back out again and uh, head over towards uh, Juneau and get to some terrain that will be familiar to some of you. I'm, I, I suspect that some of you will have, will have been to Juneau, Alaska, and will have seen some of what we're going to see in a couple of minutes here. So we're going to go to a glacier that's right next door to uh, Juneau. It's called the Mendenhall Glacier. and uh, it took us a little bit of practice to, to find Juno. Juno is a small town and uh, it's accessible by, by air and by water. I don't think you can drive to Juno. And uh, the time I went there, I, I went by air. And of course, it's the capital of the state of Alaska. And uh, you can see it's got a nice big uh, airport. And then within just a, a few minutes drive of, from downtown Juno, is the Mendenhall Glacier. And some of you are probably familiar with James Balog and his program on extreme ice. Uh, he's given presentations to numerous uh, organizations in Denver. Some of you might have seen his material uh, featured at the Denver airport. He had videos uh, at the train stations in the Denver airport showing the changes of the ice through time. And he, he and his colleagues were kind enough to uh, let us use one of their videos of this Mendenhall Glacier. So we're going to position it here. You can see Kachun is sort of lining up. You're seeing a glacier coming out of the high mountains, coming down towards sea level. And this is a glacier that has been carefully documented uh, by the work of James Balog and his team with the Extreme Ice Survey. 
and here you can see it uh, through time. This is about a 10 year cycle and uh, you'll see the glacier pouring out of the mountains and then coming into this pond uh, or lake where it is melting. But if you pay close attention to the glacier, you'll see that it, it is actually losing mass. It's, it's both getting shorter and shrinking down uh, as it melts. And uh, all of the glaciers of the world are melting. Here you can see the red outline is the maximum extent of the Mendenhall Glacier back in about uh, in 2007. And then over the course of about 10 years, it shrinks down dramatically. So this is from 2007 to 2017, and uh, a tremendous change in the character of the ice of the Mendenhall Glacier. And of course, the part of the story here, of course, is that the ice of the world is melting as the world gets warmer. And every glacier that we've looked at and every ice field that we've studied uh, has been shrinking. Uh, the evidence of the ice, though, is, is etched into the rocks. We don't, we don't lose the evidence of the ice. The evidence is very clear. And we're going to now scoot on a quick tour over to Colorado. And we want to come to Colorado just to bring it home to our people here at the Denver Museum. And you'll see that the uh, features of the Colorado Rockies right behind us here in uh, along the front range have been modified by ice. And we're going to go, we're going to start our, our little story right near Leadville. Um, we're going to go to uh, the Twin Lakes area just behind Leadville or just southwest of Leadville. And we're going to look at the uh, effects of ice that's no longer there. But because we've studied modern glaciers and we can see what the glacial patterns look like, we can interpret the geological record or the landscape, the geomorphology, and understand its configuration uh, and recognize that at one point there was ice uh, just here. So we're in the upper part of the Arkansas River drainage just south of the town of Leadville. And we're zooming in on something called Twin Lakes. And you can see the lake is sort of held in the arms of a big uh, ridge of moraine. That's glacial material that has been pushed out uh, back in the ice ages. And actually Twin Lakes has two lakes. That's why it's called Twin Lakes. And there's a little moraine that separates the small lake from the big lake. And that represents an episode of uh, pulsed glacial activity. It might be the Younger Dryas associated with glacial activity in the last ice age. You'll also see a lake on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, that's a high pond. And that's actually a pump storage facility. It's a battery. We're using water as a battery here on the side of this glacial system. We pump the water up using electricity when we have abundant electricity. And then we let the water flow down and generate electric, electric power when we need excess power. As we look up the, the valley here, there's no ice in view. That U-shaped configuration and the glacial moraines are clear evidence that there once was ice here, hundreds of feet thick. And this was the site of a Pleistocene glacier uh, on the front of the what would be the collegiate range here. And uh, of course, it's characteristic of these mountains. Uh, you might see this if you look in, up in Rocky Mountain National Park. You drive around the, the Colorado Rocky Mountains, you'll see many examples of U-shaped valleys. And we do have some relict glaciers in Colorado, but they're small. <laughs> and some of them are covered with rocks called rock glaciers. Uh, but this is a beautiful example of a glacially carved terrain, illustrating the power of ice to shape the landscape. As these glaciers have carved the land, the mountains are actually falling apart in some cases. and uh, the, where the mountains are falling apart, there are big fissures that are opening up. And some of these are visible up in Rocky Mountain National Park. And they're called Sakung, which is something that I've learned from Vince Matthews, who I think is attending this lecture. So Vince described these things to us. And we've seen where the mountains are actually falling apart as the glaciers had carved away the material on their edges. We're going to come down towards Georgetown now. Uh, you can see the I-70 corridor, if you can pick it out, Dillon Reservoir just went off the screen on the left. The Eisenhower Tunnel is there on the left and uh, the interstate highway runs right down the main valley. Georgetown, if we hold the view here for a sec, Kachun, the Georgetown's at the foot of the, right where the valley curves. And for those of you who've driven up the road to, uh, to Guanella Pass, uh, you'll know there's a steep road that comes out of 
uh, Georgetown switch backs up into that valley where there's also a pump storage facility, incidentally, another battery. But the glacials, glaciers fed into the Georgetown Valley and one glacier dropped down a big cliff coming into the town of Georgetown. And it would have had old gives or old jives in its day. It would have had those, those uh, little rumples in it because there would have been the annual pulse of that glacier. In any case, it comes down into the valley and this will be familiar country to those of you who've driven up uh, on I-70 and it, you drop down out of Georgetown, you've got a very flat bottom valley, you've got a U-shaped valley and the ice filled this valley 800, 500, 800 feet deep. And uh, there's the town of Georgetown right in the foreground. As you look up, there's a little notch just above the lake on the horizon there. The ice used to flow across that notch over to the town of Empire and so you would have had ice going to the right, heading towards uh, Idaho Springs, ice going over that ridge into the town of Empire, and then all of it converging down, flowing towards uh, Denver. And a lot of people wonder, well, how far did the ice come during the ice ages? You know, was Denver under ice? You know, what, what did it look like uh, back here in, in the ice ages? And we've studied the terrain in the canyon. We've looked closely at the both for polished rock. You can sometimes see the striations of ice on the rock. Uh, we've studied that. We've looked at the boulders carried by the ice, which would be the moraines and the glacial till. And we think the ice kept on going here. It kept on going a little bit further. And you'll see just, we're gonna come around a corner here in, in just a moment. And uh, we will be getting to the town of Idaho Springs, which is about as far down as we think the ice got. So here's the there's the, the football field of the high school. This is Idaho Springs. And uh, this is about as far down as ice got during the ice ages. So from Denver, we would not have been able to see this ice, but, but if we would have had to drive, you know, go up into the mountains to find the toes of the glaciers in Colorado. Now we're gonna continue our tour here. We're gonna use the wonderful open space tools and we're gonna do a, a a, a relatively quick global tour to show you ice in other settings and it'll partly set up the later part of the talk. We're going to leave uh, the Rocky Mountains and cross across the northern part of uh, North America and the United States and we're going to cross past Newfoundland and Labrador and we're going to uh, take a quick look at Greenland which is just coming into view here and Greenland is as was mentioned, Mitch sort of mentioned it, that it was some kind of a real estate scam by the Vikings or something because there's not a lot of green in Greenland. Uh, it's pretty much covered in, in ice and snow. And there have been times when it's been settled and there are small communities in Greenland, but not very many people live in Greenland. And it's, it's as you'll see here using OpenView, it's, uh, it's a pretty um, open space. It's a pretty uh, inhospitable land you know, a rocky surface, uh, glaciers coming down uh, various valleys, feeding directly into the ocean and spawning icebergs. Tremendous numbers of icebergs are, are spawned here. And, and Greenland is, is melting. The, it, every year, there's, uh, it's a little bit warmer and it's, it's losing about 50 cubic miles of ice per year. Uh, and we'll come to that here later in our talk. But as we, we can uh, sort of spin ourselves around um, having introduced Greenland here. Uh, some of these glaciers have been studied by James Baylog with his uh, extreme ice survey. And uh, it's, a, it's a fabulous area, but, but extreme and, and dangerous. Uh, a, a friend of mine, Connie Steffen, lost his life here just a few months ago, uh, actually falling into an ice crevasse. He was a wonderful uh, University of Colorado Boulder series a scientist. Uh, here we're coming into Iceland, which does have some green, and we're looking at Vatnajökull and some of the other uh, uh, glaciers in uh, Iceland. And of course, Iceland is a volcanic island, and there's very amazing uh, contrast between volcanoes and ice. Some of the volcanoes erupt underneath the glacial caps, and they produce melted water that comes roaring out underneath the glaciers, and they're called Jökulhalps. The glaciers come out called the big glacial floods onto these floodplains. And you, again, you can see some of the same 
uh, colors associated with rock falls. And in some cases, these are ash deposits. And there was a famous um, volcanic eruption here back in, in 2010, I think in April of 2010, and it spewed out um, ash onto some of these uh, glaciers. And Kachun was actually traveling at the time and he was marooned in Europe, such a challenge, <laughs> because the aircraft couldn't fly across Iceland because of the volcanic ash in the air, which of course is extremely deleterious to jet aircraft engines. And that mountain that erupted is somewhere very near here. And uh, this is possibly some of the ash from that eruption uh, on the ice. And it's, uh, it's a volcano that's curiously challenging to speak its name. And it's, uh, for the Icelandic people, it's trivial because it's, its name means I island mountain glacier. And they say island mountain glacier really fast. And that's Ayafatlia Yokel. And so they say Ayafatlia Yokel very fast. And it's uh, famously unpronounceable for many of us in, in our culture. And uh, Kachun threatened me that he was going to come close to this volcano and ask me to say its name. So I'm preempting here a little bit. But he told me that what I had to do was go to YouTube. So I, he said, go to YouTube and study how to pronounce the volcano's name so that you can say it nicely when we show it here. That's it. And you can see actually the black is the, is the recent ash and the white is what it looked like before. These are two images side by side. And so the Ayafayatla Yokel volcano is right there. And I struggled hard on my YouTube studies of how to say its name. And I finally got somebody to, that, that I learned the trick. They, somebody said the trick on YouTube is for an American, if you want to say the name of this volcano, you say, yo, I forgot the yogurt. And if you say, yo, I forgot the yogurt fast enough, you've almost replicated the name of this volcano in Icelandic. So just something to, a little trick if you're traveling in Iceland, don't forget the yogurt. So, so we'll, we're going to back out and uh, we're, we're trucking around the world here. We've got a couple more places we need, want to go to uh, with our global tour. And uh, many of you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time working in Africa, so I'm super partial to some glaciers in Africa. And I'm super partial to glaciers that are right on the equator in, in Africa. And many of you will know sort of what we're thinking about here. And uh, if you were to go to the equator on the border between Kenya and Tanzania, the highest mountain in Africa has beautiful ice on it. And of course, we're zooming in on Kilimanjaro. And you can see Kilimanjaro from a long way out. It's halfway between Lake Victoria and the Indian Ocean. And uh, it's a very prominent mountain sitting amongst the plains. It's really near the, the Amboseli Plains and near the Serengeti Plains. And the mountain rises dramatically. Um, and it's got an ice cover on top on top. Kilimanjaro is about 19,300 feet uh, in elevation. And uh, it's got these rings of vegetation. It's got banana plantations down near the bottom. And you come up through forested area, eventually get into scrub area. And eventually near the top, of course, you're getting into tundra and, and bare rock. The snow on top of Kilimanjaro has been uh, the, melting. The glaciers have been melting. And uh, Lonnie Thompson, who we'll talk about in a few minutes, uh, has studied these ice layers. And there's residual ice from the Pleistocene up on top of Mount Kilimanjaro, but it's melting quickly. They do get annual snow cover. So you'll see pictures of Kilimanjaro with snow cover, but the ice itself is retreating. And it's losing about 2% to 3% per year. And you can't go very many years without eventually going away. You'll see the nested craters there on the summit. It's a very beautiful volcano, uh, again, in, on the equator in Tanzania. So we might get an, let's look at it obliquely Kachin, so we can sort of get a sense of the, of the height of this mountain. It's a really prominent volcanic structure. And the ice up there is, is uh, in these residual little patches and a couple of buddies and myself we climbed up to the to the rim of this volcano back in the 1970s and there's not a lot of air up at 19,000 feet we were we were struggling for for our breath 
but we did see, we saw the snows and we saw the ice. And uh, if I ever get back there again, it'd be fun to get a closer view inside the crater. I hear that there's active fumaroles in there and you can get samples of sulfur up on the top of Kilimanjaro. And we're gonna take one last uh, look at one last uh, glacial area. We're gonna back out from Africa and we're gonna cross across the Indian Ocean and we're gonna go across the uh, Makran range and we're gonna get ourselves into Northern Pakistan. And in Northern Pakistan, we're gonna be looking at the area around Mount K2, which is the second highest mountain in the world. And of course it is uh, beset by glaciers on all sides. It's on the border actually between Pakistan and China. We're crossing uh, across the uh, North Indian Ocean here. You'll see the subcontinent up ahead. Uh, we're going to go up along the Indus River, which is the uh, green stripe there on the left, uh, up across Pakistan, up into the Himalayas. And this is this is the um, Karakoram and Khoistan area of, of Pakistan, up on the border between Pakistan and China and India sort of a complicated political area in a zone of tremendously diverse and rugged topography. And the K2 mountain is, is almost a mile and a half taller than Kilimanjaro. It's about 28,000 feet high, uh, second highest mountain in the world. And we've struggled sometimes to find it. And I think that um, Kachun is angling for some landmarks here. But the glacier that's coming down off of it is, I can sort of see it in the left hand side of the image there. The, the glacier that comes off of it is called the Baltoro Glacier. And it comes down towards a town called Skardu in, in Pakistan. And I think it's the, it's a little bit to the left here, Kachuna. I think the, the, the mountain's somewhere in the main complex and the glacier's feeding off to the left, flowing from, from the right to the left or from east to west. And this glacier, some of you will have read uh, Greg Mortensen's Three Cups of Tea, uh, which is a wonderful story about uh, his adventures in, in Pakistan, eventually leading him to build schools. And he was on the edge of the Baltoro Glacier, which is right below us here. Uh, and he got lost. And there's a famous part of that book where someone finds him and sort of leads him back and feeds him lunch or something. And uh, that, that begins, uh, Greg Mortensen's quest to build schools for the children living up in this high mountain area. So, so this is uh, one of the amazing parts of the world that we can get to using this incredible technology. Uh, and, and you can get vistas here in, in lands that honestly, it's super hard to get here, you know, super, super hard. And then the political situation between Pakistan and India and China is very fraught. And uh, so there's, in addition to the physical difficulties of getting up into this country, there's a lot of political challenges with just getting permission. So we can use these tools, Open Space and Google Earth and others, to investigate what's going on in some of these regions that we can't actually uh, visit ourselves. And so it's a wonderful ability to, to gaze at the world. And I really encourage you all to grab Google Earth and spend some time you can retrace some of the steps of our of our jaunt this evening, and you can see some of these things for yourselves. And, and it's it's really fun to do that and become more familiar with, with the earth we live on. We're gonna shift gears a little bit now, having done sort of a, a global tour, and we're now going to uh, look a little bit more in detail at the effect of melting ice and, and its impact on sea level. And uh, we're gonna step back out and, and we've got a couple of videos here that we're going to uh, line up and it, it causes a little bit of a gear shifting for Kachun. He's got to um, get the thing to, to work just right, but we will get um, a couple of views here. The first thing we're going to look at is the is sea ice in the Arctic area. And the image that you're seeing right now on open space doesn't show the sea ice. It just shows the land uh, and the ocean is colored in blue, but we're going to see what the what the ice looks like there on the on the Arctic Ocean, and uh, I think you'll see it's it's pretty interesting to see the ice change through time. This is a time lapse photograph starting in the early 90s, and you'll see the 
the, the years are ticking by up on the top of the screen and the whole system is getting uh, smaller as the ice gradually melts. The color codes here, the older ice is showing up as white. The younger ice, thinner ice is showing up as different colors of blue, but it, it comes up to about 2019 and then it goes back to the 1980s. So in the 1980s, there was substantial cover of older ice, which is the white color. And then you'll see as each year goes by, there's a little bit less. And you can vividly see how it flows across the northern part of Greenland down towards Iceland. A lot of that ice is carried down along the coast of Greenland and heading into the uh, North Atlantic, where it's of course a hazard to navigation as the people in the Titanic found out. So dramatic changes through time and uh, a wonderful way to see the, uh, the data here using these time-lapse videos, uh, courtesy of NASA and uh, NOAA. So it's a wonderful government collaboration and it's uh, your tax dollars at work giving us these kinds of data sets, wonderful data sets to look at. Uh, we're gonna now get back down to Greenland. We introduced it a little bit ago and I mentioned that it's losing a massive amount of ice every year, but let's look at how we understand the ice uh, situation on Greenland. And we're going to introduce a data set, uh, which is actually radar flown from aircraft, uh, looking at the thickness of the ice in Greenland. So we're going to scoot down in and use another video, uh, again, courtesy of, of NOAA and uh, the National Snow and Ice Data Center. And uh, you'll see the little airplane there. It's a little mock-up, and it's, it's sending radar signals down into the ice. And this is an actual image that it depicts. And you can see the layers in the ice of Greenland. The brown at the bottom is the bedrock. And the ice layers are thousands of years old. And they've been calibrated by drilling. There's a series of ice cores that have been cored. We'll talk about that in a second. And you'll see it's up to 8,000 years old, uh, 130,000 years old at the very bottom. And then they put together a string of different coverages using this radar system. And they created a three-dimensional model of the ice in green. And we're going to see that three-dimensional model here where the youngest in the ice is in the green, the middle-aged ice is in the blue, and the very old ice is the red down at the very bottom. And the brown is the bedrock. Bedrock's actually at sea level and sometimes a little bit below sea level. The ice is about three kilometers thick in Greenland, and we've got multiple cores. So we've cored it, and we've radared it, and we've created this three-dimensional model that allows us to understand the thickness of the ice. And of course, we're looking at it as it changes through time. So we'll follow this video. We're gonna have the last ice age ice colored in blue. And then the ice age from before that, the very old ice on the bottom is from the previous ice age, so-called Eemian and pre-Eemian ice, very down, down there at the very bottom. Actually, very, relatively poorly known because the it's all been mushed. The ice at the very bottom of Greenland doesn't have its ice layers anymore. It's been mushed, and so it's very difficult to to understand that. But we have drilled into it. We've got samples of of that ice. Here you'll see it coming back across. Fantastic videos put together by NASA's visualization team. They've done an absolutely wonderful job. So so that's uh, that's that's Greenland as seen from from above and from inside. Uh, we've also been looking at the mass of the ice through time. And I think we've got a mass slide. It might be an image. Yeah, so this is, this is a, a graph showing the ice loss in terms of its mass in Greenland. And this data comes from a pair of satellites that cruise around and they look at the gravitational attraction. So they're actually looking at the masses, the mass beneath them and the two satellites are traveling and they're shooting a laser between them. They're extremely sensitive. And if there's an increase in mass, they pull, the first one accelerates a little bit, they pull apart. If there's a decrease in mass, it sort of slows down a little bit. And so by measuring the distance between these two satellites, it's called the GRACE satellite system, they can monitor changes in mass. And there's a little spot there where it says no data in 2018. That's because they phased out the first GRACE satellites and they put in a follow-on GRACE satellite mission. So there was a little bit of time there where they didn't have the system running. But you can see systematically the loss of ice from Greenland. And it is the rate of loss is accelerating. And of course, the ice water is going into the, into the ocean and it's contributing to sea level rise. So as we lose ice in Greenland, 
we are uh, contributing uh, water to the oceans and the world oceans are going up. Sea level rise is about three millimeters per year. And somewhere on the order of 0.7 millimeters per year, depending a little bit on whose numbers, is coming from the melting of uh, the Greenland ice mass. So the we'll back away from this graph and uh, we've got a little image. I think here we, we can see the sea level rise. We can, now let's look at this one, Kachuna. So here, this is a, this is a data set that's a, a complicated story. This is a sea level change since 1880. And back in the 1800s and early 1900s, of course, we measured sea level by putting a stick on the edge of the ocean and watching the stick to see what would happen. And uh, it turns out it's very complicated because sea level changes depending on where you are and which kind of a geological setting you're in. But since the 1970s and 80s, we've had satellite data and the sea level curve is coming from satellite data now. And it's actually put together by a team in Boulder. If you Google sea level change and Boulder, you'll come up with the, the shop in Boulder that does it. And then they're wonderful people. I've chatted with them and they're taking, this is data that derived from uh, radar, uh, uh, from satellite and radar data and you know literally millions and millions of data points averaged together and uh, the data have become more and more robust as we go forward and we've got a very good understanding of sea level rise in the last uh, several decades and it's about three millimeters per year 3.3 millimeters per year right around now and you might say well that doesn't sound like very much three millimeters you know the thickness of a penny or something but i'm a geologist and, and that's a that gets your attention. And uh, we've got huge numbers of people living at sea level and in, in, our, in our coastal cities like New York and uh, Miami, and San Francisco, and of course, all around the world. Um, you know, think of Bangladesh and Nigeria and Indonesia, many cities right on the sea on the coast. And as sea level is rising, uh, we're going to be facing increasing challenges with with our coastal population. And so here's a, a, one of the effects of global change. And it's largely the melting of ice. About two thirds of the sea level rise is associated with melting ice. The other third actually is the thermal expansion of water. And Katrina, I don't know if you've got that uh, temperature. There's sort of a globe with a warm top. It's the 2020. Yeah, this, this image is showing the thermal changes that are accentuated at high latitudes. This is a, co a color-coded trend map and the trend of increasing warmth is shown in the reds. And the Arctic area is getting warmer faster than other parts of the world. And in large part because of that reflectance shift. So as you leave, as you lose surface ice cover and snow cover, uh, the reflectivity is changed from being very reflective to being absorptive. And so if we go from ice covered water, which would reflect almost all the energy that hits it, when you take that ice away, the sea surface is very dark colored and it absorbs the energy from the sun, little as it might be. And that's contributing to a great rate of change. And so the Arctic area is warming, the waters are warming. And one of the big challenges in Greenland is that the coastal glaciers are flowing out into the ocean. And you can see the Western side of Greenland there has warming trends and those warming trends are affecting the rate at which the glaciers are melting and flowing off of Greenland. If all the ice on Greenland were to melt, world sea level would rise seven meters. So there's a tremendous uh, concern about the rate of which the ice on land is melting. If the ice in the sea melts, of course, it doesn't really change the level of the water, as you can imagine from an experiment with a cup of ice water with ice cubes in it. It doesn't overflow when the ice melts. But when the, when the ice on land melts, that contributes directly to sea level rise. And that's a global concern that we're facing right now. So let's, uh, let's look a little bit more at the, where the data is coming from. We're going to sort of wrap up our, our view of the Earth's ice here with looking at the ice coring, which I've mentioned to you a couple of times. And we've got a, a video that we've put together showing uh, coring of ice in, in Greenland and in some of the uh, mountains in the in Peru, tremendous technical systems here with the ice drilling machine, pulling up cores of ice. The ice is studied very carefully. 
you can see it with millimeters there and with the layers very visible in the in the ice those represent annual layers these people are working inside a building that's been dug into the ground in greenland and then we're going to go over to lonnie thompson's lab uh, in ohio here's lonnie thompson he studies the mountain glaciers including kilimanjaro let's pause here for a moment kachin i just want to mention that this is lonnie's lab uh, at the university of ohio but it's just like the one at lakewood if you go to the federal center in building 810 we have a ice storage facility just like this. They store core from Antarctica at the USGS and the Federal Center in Building A10 in a beautiful refrigerated building just like this. And it's minus 40 degrees in there. And minus 40 is the same Fahrenheit and centigrade. The curves cross at minus 40. So minus 40 C is the same as minus 40 F. And I go there with students from the Colorado School of Mines. And there's you stand at the door of this thing and there's some jackets there. and these are geophysics students and, and they're they're tough and and, uh, and and there's guys and there's girls and the girls will say well i think i'm going to put on a jacket and the, the guys say oh no i'm tough it's warm i'm warm and they go in to this uh ice storage facility and it's really minus 40 and uh, it's sort of like that that movie about the march of the penguins you get these students in there and they they huddle up and there's a cluster of students and the ones in the middle try to stay in the middle ones on the outside try to get under the inside and the and there's this, this sort of mass of students trying to stay warm because they didn't wear jackets and it's minus 40 and i'm trying to get them to look at the ice core and look at the layers kitchen we can like it go now and, and uh we're going to walk on through this lab and see how they do the studies of it you can see they use a light table and trying to get the students to look at this light table when they're freezing it was a little bit hard they get little crystals of ice in their eyelashes and here are the ice you can see it's got bubbles in it and these bubbles are super important and i think uh, we'll we'll finish the video and then we might have that slide of uh ice with layers kachun i think it might show up and uh this is we, we stuck it in yeah so this is this is a, an example of the ice core from greenland and you can see the annual layers. This is from about a kilometer down. And you can see little white things in there. Those are actually bubbles of air. And the bubbles of air are in the ice. And when we study the ice, we can melt little cubes like you saw a minute ago and extract the air that's actually frozen into the ice. And so we're using the ice as a layered system to look at what the composition of the Earth's air was like through time. And it's a wonderful story. And it's been worked out in tremendous detail. Many students have spent many years counting these layers. And there are little volcanic ashes in there so we can calibrate them because we have the historical records of volcanic eruptions. So we've got the combination of the, of the volcanic eruptions calibrating it. And then we can count these things down year after year. And there's 130,000 layers in, in Greenland and more in Antarctica. And the students count those layers in the in the ice core facility at, at the at the federal center and if they don't get the right number they've got to recount again so it's it's really quite a, a chore but it's produced a wonderful data set and uh, let's see if we can see that the graphs there this is the the data set sort of my last graph here uh, but here you can see uh, there's two curves one is the carbon dioxide through time there's a, this thousand ad to 2000 ad is a um, bottom axis and the top curve is the carbon dioxide the bottom curve is the methane and these are data derived from the ice cores and then in the case of the carbon dioxide curve the the little little black stripe on the right hand side of it is actually physical measurements and a fellow named uh, david keeling obtained those measurements starting in in hawaii uh, and it's been continued since uh, his work. We call the right-hand part of that the Keeling curve, named after David Keeling. And it shows the great increase in carbon dioxide and methane in our atmosphere uh, through time, associated particularly with the post, say, 19, the 1800s. Uh, and it's largely associated with the Industrial Revolution and the combustion of uh, hydrocarbons and the effects of human activities. And of course, this is the change in the overall composition of the atmosphere that has modified the greenhouse effect on the surface of the Earth. And it's leading to the global warming that we've been talking about. And of course, leading to the melting of the, of the ice on Earth. And so we've got the Earth as a water planet. We might get, take, we don't need the slide there. It's a water planet, the beautiful blue dot. 
And uh, we're gonna turn our conversation now to sort of global thinking. Um, I wanna mention just that the, the challenge of global warming and the challenge of climate change is of course very real. The data are abundant and very well documented through the history of the ice cores as you've seen them. And uh, we have a tremendous challenge, a population of 7.234 billion people. And how do we keep them all happy on the globe at a time of great transition in, in terms of character of our climate, sea level, agricultural practices, things like that. So those are issues that we're gonna be turning over to the next generation. We're giving them wonderful tools to work on it. And uh, we also use the, the shapes and character of the ice on our planet to think about others or other places. And let's, I'll hand the microphone back over to Kachun here and he'll uh, describe what we're seeing in Antarctica and then what it might do to help us do other exploration. All right, well, thank you, Bob. Now, I am an astronomer and not a geologist, um, and I don't st study ice, but I've um, flown around um, quite a bit in planetarium software uh, like this, and I think it's a lot of fun um, to be able to, um, to look at structures on the Earth in uh, a place like Antarctica, and uh, we're flying down towards an area, um, and as we come down here, you'll see... Um, lots of interesting um, ice structures. And um, if we pan around, we'll actually see um, what looks like, you know, flows um, from um, the main part of Antarctica into the, the sea. And um, you can see fragmentation of, of the ice. And, um, and so as it's coming down, it's breaking apart. And, um, and part of the, um, part of that might um, refreeze again. And so it um, basically looks like a, um, uh, a jumble um, kind of um, bunch of uh, puzzle pieces. But, um, but this is something you know, that we can recognize here on Earth. But what planetary scientists do is they often use what they um, learn um, and see and observe on the Earth and apply it um, elsewhere um, in the solar system. And so um, what I'll spend the last couple minutes doing is just talking about water and ice, not in the context of the earth, but in a more cosmic context. Um, and uh, so let's, um, we can reflect on uh, the role of water and ice um, in our universe and in our solar system. Now it turns out that water is actually one of the most common substances in the universe. And so not only do we find it on our home planet, but um, we find it elsewhere in our solar system. So um, we know um, we have really good evidence that um, in certain craters on the moon, um, in certain patches of those craters where um, sunlight doesn't reach, um, we find um, evidence of ice. Um, we, there might be ice on Mercury. We think there's ice um, in the soil um, uh, on, more, on Mars, and there's water and ice in the atmospheres of the outer planets. And uh, I'll just keep um, flying away until we sort of see the rest of the solar system. And then it turns out that um, the asteroids and comets, all these minor bodies, um, you know, many of them very small, but there are hundreds of thousands, not many millions of them throughout our solar system. We find evidence that um, they contain a lot of ice um, as well. And, and we think that um, our Earth was filled up by, um, by comets and asteroids um, impacting the Earth, and they deposited water, and that and basically filled up our oceans. But what I want to do now is focus on one of the uh, moons of Jupiter, because it turns out that um, some of the most amazing places to find ice and water are actually in the uh, moons of the outer planets. And in fact, individually, some of these moons actually contain more water than there is water on Earth in, in Earth's oceans. And so flying down to um, Europa, which is a, a relatively large moon of Jupiter. It's uh, slightly smaller than, um, than our moon. And as we come down, so I need to change time to, you 
you'll see a, a very smooth um, ice covered body. And what we think um, is happening with Europa is that there's a icy shell several tens of uh, miles uh, deep. And um, it basically encases an ocean of water underneath. And that ocean can contain up to, and if not more than um, twice the amount of water that exists here on Earth. And um, here um, we're seeing Europa. And um, what's really interesting is that um, this icy um, crust, this icy surface, is covered in cracks. So you see all these lines crisscrossing the surface. And so they consist of cracks and troughs and ridges. Um, there are tectonic and tidal forces that are stretching and cracking Europa's uh, surface. And that's what we're, we're seeing. But we're gonna zoom in on this region called Kanamora uh, Chaos. And um, as the name um, suggests, um, this region is very chaotic. And this is a somewhat low res um, image. So I'm gonna uh, put on a high res um, image taken from the Galileo spacecraft. And so you can sort of see those um, two lines crisscrossing diagonally, they, they correspond. Um, and, um, and you can see a, a very chaotic um, region, hence the name uh, Kanamora Chaos. And what it looks like is basically a bunch of um, ice that's been jumbled and broken apart. And planetary scientists have studied regions like this using images like this. And they've been able to basically put the jigsaw uh, puzzle pieces back together. And so here um, is an example of um, how they think the ice has shifted um, over time. And uh, in this case, instead of the sun uh, warming uh, the ice from above, like what we see in an Antarctica, uh, planetary scientists think um, there uh, was an up upwelling of water and slush from underneath that melted the ice on the surface. And that um, allowed those blocks to, um, to shift and move, and then they refroze again. But um, so, so this is reminiscent of what we saw in Antarctica, but the processes uh, are somewhat different, but they do um, create um, somewhat similar uh, phenomena, or at least they look um, somewhat similar. So um, what we find is that um, there are patterns and uh, phenomena that are similar um, throughout the universe. And what we study on the Earth can help us understand what's going on with other worlds. And Bob started off at the beginning of this presentation talking about the availability of water on Earth, and especially fresh water. But um, what we also know is that terrestrial water has its origins uh, from extraterrestrial sources. And water is found not just on Earth, but throughout our solar system. And it probably exists in other planets and other solar systems throughout our galaxy. And so this suggests that there are many more places that life could have started and not just on Earth. And we used to think that um, only Earth-like worlds were the places to um, start looking for extraterrestrial life. But as we learn more about the origins of, of water, and uh, the places where water can occur, you know, the fact that there are multiple ocean worlds, we think, just in our solar system, that gives us you know, uh, definitely a lot more potential for uh, finding life elsewhere in the universe. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Bob and I think uh, we're ready to answer some questions from the audience. Yeah, great. Thank you, Kachun, and I think, uh... Mitch, maybe you've got a chance to su summarize some of the discussion in the chat, and uh, we've got a few minutes. I don't know how many minutes we'll take, but uh, we're just past the eight o'clock hour. If we if you give us maybe five or six minutes for Q and A, it'd be very good. Yeah, and so thank you everyone for joining us, and that was amazing and super fascinating. Um, we recognize that it is a weeknight, so we are going to stick around and do some questions. But if you can't stick around, we totally understand. Thank you so much for joining us, and we hope we'll see you next time. Um, and I put a short survey in the chat there that we'd really appreciate if you could take. Um, so we got a lot of questions. Unfortunately, we'll get to all of them. But one thing multiple people asked is, is the melting ice in Greenland changing the salinity of the ocean? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. And of course, it has to be changing the salinity locally 
because you've got all the fresh water arriving and it will tend to be low density. So it would probably float out across the uh, ocean in the, that area between Greenland and, uh, and Newfoundland and, and Nova Scotia. Uh, on a global scale, my, my gut feeling is that the, the amount of ice that's melting, even though it's significant and it's contributing to sea level rise, uh, it, in terms of its proportional contribution to the volume of the entire sea, I suspect that the, the aggregate salinity is not changing very much, but that'd be a fun calculation that uh, somebody could do. We could walk through the arithmetic and uh, you'd have to have a lot of uh, decimal points in your calculations to see that change effect, I think. Um, we had another, like you started off telling us about why the poles are so much colder than the rest of the planet. Um, and someone pointed out that recently researchers have found palm tree remains in ice cores from the North Pole. So what changed? <laughs> so so uh, through geologic time, uh, of course, there's been tremendous changes in, in, in the climate. And for example, uh, some of the palm that you might have seen uh, in Alaska, there's some good examples uh, uh, and NOVA programs that, that uh, Kirk Johnson was involved in prying up a leaf uh, in the coast of Alaska, palm leaf. And that would have dated back to a time when it was much warmer uh, on the whole earth in the Paleocene, Eocene times. So the uh, Arctic conditions have, have changed dramatically through time uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, the, when you drill down to the bottom of the Greenland ice sheet, which one of the cases they did this, one of the Danish teams, they found a, what looks to me like a pine needle. <laughs> so it wasn't a palm leaf, but there is a pine needle. There's a photograph of a piece of ice core with something that looks suspiciously like a pine needle from the very bottom of the Greenland uh, ice cores, which would have been that back in the previous interglacial, when it was relatively warm, there may have been you know, pine forests in, in Greenland. That is possible. Interesting. So there's a lot more at stake than just the angle of the planet that determines the climate. Um, we had another person ask, is as the sea level rises, how does that affect our baseline for elevation? Well, that's a very good question. And, and of course, a critical one for us in Colorado, because <laughs> we're very proud of our 14,000 foot peaks. And uh, those 14,000 foot peaks, the 14ers, are calibrated based on sea level. And some of you might not know this, but we've, we've struggled to get 54 of them or whatever that number is, 14ers. And many of you will know that number better than I do. But I do know that several of those puppies are just about 14,001 foot high, thereby qualifying. And as sea level is rising, that is the basis from which we calculate elevation. So I was talking about this with the students over at the School of Mines a while ago. And they assured me not to worry that they've got a team of students that are carrying rocks up to the tops of those 14ers so that every time sea level rises a millimeter or two, they've stuck another rock up on top of those mountains. So they'll stay above 14,000 feet. Uh, excellent. Um, so we're getting right down to the end of our time. So just a couple more questions. Can you explain the brilliant blue color that we see in the glaciers? Well, it's, uh, I might let Kachun elaborate on this, but it does, it has to do with scattering, but Kachun, you might, would you like to just- uh, Actually, I, I probably don't know enough to hazard an explanation. Well, we can, it's, it, it has to do with the, yeah. the preferential scattering of, of blue light. And so uh, you'll often see uh, particularly uh, water that has a lot of glacial flour in it or debris in it. Will, will be sort of milky colored, of course. And it's, it's, it's scattering light. And it's, I think it's amplified uh, by the reflection of, of, the, of the blue sky. And the sky is blue because of scattering. So what, what happens in the sky? Why is the sky blue? The sky is blue because the longer wavelengths of light are, are, are coming through, the, the blue is being scattered. So if you look at away from the sun at the sky, you're seeing the scattered light, which is the blue light preferentially scattered by the, by the particulates in the, in the atmosphere. And that is uh, illuminating the water and the water is also scattering. So I think it's a combination of optical effects that are preferentially giving you the blue color with the, the 
with the longer wavelengths getting through, the shorter wavelengths being scattered back. All right, and I think we're about out of time. So this last one is not actually a question, but Corinne, who is seven years old, uh, wanted you to know that the ice progression is so cool. <laughs> so thank you for that. <laughs> Um, I, I think ice is, ice is really cool, and I think that it's a fun thing that we're, we're going to do a program like this for students. So, Corinne, you might find through your schools and others might find there's something called Digital Earth Academy. It's a brand new program being run through the Denver Museum, and it's going to parallel some of these Digital Earth presentations. And uh, if you're a student in the Denver metro area uh, or a student anywhere in the world, if you can get your class to participate in this, it's a program through the Denver Museum. And... Uh, it's designed for young people. So it will show young people how cool ice is. And there's some amazing experiments that Mitch was involved in uh, illustrating how cool ice is. <laughs> yeah, so thank you again, everyone for joining us. Thank you so much, Bob and Kachun. That was really wonderful. Um, and we hope we can see you. We have a program coming up March 24th with this same cast of characters uh, all about Stonehenge to skyscrapers. We'll be going around the earth looking for man-made structures that we can see, human-made structures, I should say, that we can see from space. Um, and thank you again so much for joining us.